President Biden's troubles at home and abroad. For an American president to be silent on an issue of human rights, is this consistent with who we are and who I am? President Biden meets face to face with Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman, a leader he once promised to make a pariah. While across the world, a key Democratic senator deals the president and his agenda a major blow. Plus, this was not a spontaneous call to action, but rather was a deliberate strategy decided upon in advance by the president. Alarming new details from this week's January 6th committee hearing. I think that it got to the point where the screaming was completely, completely out there. And what they were proposing, I thought was nuts. I don't think any of these people were providing the president with good advice. Explosive testimony, including for the first time from President Trump's White House counsel, as the committee gears up for what may be the last in this series of public hearings. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm Lisa Desjardins. Yamiche Alcindor is away. A high stakes dance on the world stage is underway as President Biden meets with Saudi Arabia's controversial Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, a power broker in the Middle East and also the man U.S. intelligence agencies determined approved the brutal murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. With respect to the murder of Khashoggi, I raised it at the top of the meeting. He basically said that he, uh, he, he was not personally responsible for it. I, I indicated I thought he was. But here at home, the president's domestic agenda and the hopes of climate change activists have again crashed into a Joe Manchin wall. This comes as inflation numbers out this week showed a historic spike, the highest since 1981. Joining me tonight to discuss this and more is my colleague, Nick Schifrin, PBS NewsHour's foreign affairs and defense correspondent. He's in Saudi Arabia. And joining me here at the table in studio, Hans Nickel, the political reporter for Axios, and Tarini Party, White House reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks to both of you. Nick, let me start with you, who are with us at 3 a.m. local time. Let's get going with you. Staying awake for us, we appreciate it. Bring us the latest there from Saudi Arabia, and what is President Biden getting out of this trip? Well, I think he's getting out a few things. He certainly wants to get out more Saudi and OPEC plus oil production to bring down gas prices. We could talk about that, whether that's even possible. Uh, I think he's getting, um, as U.S. officials would put it, avoiding a vacuum in the Middle East when it comes to the United States. Uh, the U.S. has receded, uh, at least its influence has receded, uh, in this region over the last few years. Uh, Biden trying to stem that tide, uh, questioning, uh, I think a lot of people would question whether that's possible too. Uh, and in Israel, uh, don't, don't forget that it's important for Biden to be seen politically supporting Israeli officials. Uh, and frankly, he believes in it. He is uh, and has been for a half century a big supporter for Israel. Uh, and of course, Israel getting what it wants also uh, that presidential visit. So I, I think it's all on those three uh, levels. And, and overarching uh, this is, is more regional cooperation, product of the Abraham Accords during the Trump administration, but also militaries and intelligence services across the region uh, taking it upon themselves to cooperate because they see a common enemy in Iran. Trini, we just heard Nick talk about these three levels of, of goals from the Biden administration. But, you know, a picture sometimes can dominate things. Let's talk about the fist bump here. We knew going into it, we were going to wonder what was going to be the interaction between President Biden and um, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. They did have a fist bump, and that is getting attention from some Democrats here. He, this is someone who is known for human rights abuses. A Dem the United States has said that, and for involvement, according to the CIA and others, in the murder. Did the Saudis get what they wanted just from that photo? And did the U.S. concede something by doing it? 
uh, there's clearly a lot of discussion beforehand whether it was going to be a handshake, whether it was going to be a fist bump. And of course, we got that answer today. And the photo, of course, the Saudis released it pretty quickly thereafter. Um, and, you know, it, it does raise questions depending on what the president is able to accomplish from this meeting, whether it was worth it or not. And we're already hearing some Democrats, including Congressman Adam Schiff, raise that point. He he tweeted today basically saying that the, the, show to, the photo shows uh, the, the grip that uh, autocrats in the Middle East still hold on the U.S. and foreign policy because of because they're oil rich and can sort of have that uh, that grip on the U.S. Hans Nichols, let's get into the why of this. Yeah. I know your reporting is that the president wasn't exactly skipping and leaping into this visit, but his administration said he had to go. Why? Oil. Right? I mean, they've been talking about this really since February. They've been debating this. They've been mulling it. They've been trying to attach and find some moment for President Biden to go smooth things over with the Saudis and convince them to pump more oil because it's just a basic fact of hydrocarbons. They have more of them underneath their ground, and they can pull them out really quickly if they just flick a switch. And so officials always knew that the world needs oil. They know that they're facing a lot of energy shortages, natural gas, how cold the Europe winter is going to be is a big issue of concern inside the White House. And they were willing to risk the, the, the at least had the prospect for more oil and the risk being this photo. Uh, and, you know, we, it's hard to kind of say what the long term damage of this photo is, if it's just going to be glossed over, if it's going to stick with people. I generally have a theory that when you're covering uh, some foreign trip, the side that releases something first <laughs> is the side that's happier with it. Right? And so sometimes you get these statements that come out and say the two leaders had a productive conversation, which is code for the two leaders were yelling at each other, right? So whoever releases the photo first or something first tends to want to get out front and wants that image. And, and I think that tells us here. And here was the Saudis yeah. releasing it first. Now, now to be, I should have the caveats here and here are my confidence bands. It was a Saudi photographer. Right? And right. it was an official's photo. But, like, the White House wasn't dying to release. And we right. can check their, fe their feeds, and the White House puts out photos, to what extent this photo plays into the overall Biden mythology that they want to put out there. So, yeah, point they to position. I'm going to follow from what Hans is saying, Nick, and go to you. You raised this earlier, saying we could talk about oil and we can talk about gas prices. So, Nick, talk about it. Does this trip, will this trip have any effect on oil and gas prices in reality? So a couple of points. One is that I asked Adel al-Jaber, the deputy foreign minister, basically, in Saudi Arabia just a few minutes ago about whether they would push OPEC plus to uh, release more oil, as the national security advisor Jake Sullivan suggested, uh, or they would release more oil themselves, uh, as the president suggested tonight. Uh, and he did not say yes. Uh, he didn't say no, but he did not say yes. And he actually said that they've been producing more oil in the last nine months, that they've taken steps. Uh, to think about high gas prices, uh, and that they were not committing to take further steps to try and release enough oil to make a difference. So that's point number one. Point number mm -hmm. two is that whether the UAE uh, uh, and Saudi Arabia can release more oil. Uh, we know Mohammed bin uh, MBZ, uh, MBZ, sorry, the, the head of uh, UAE, uh, told President Macron just a few weeks ago uh, when uh, all the leaders were at the G7 that he did not think that there was enough oil that the UAE and Saudi could pump in the next six mm -hmm. months to actually affect gas prices in the United States. I mean, that is from the horse's mouth uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. And so we know that regional officials do not think that their pumping more uh, will actually lead to the kind of political benefit uh, that you guys are talking about in, in the studio. So between those two things, you know, possibly, it seems like the National Security Advisor and the President wouldn't be so confident uh, about more oil coming uh, if, if they didn't get some private reassurances. Uh, but mm -hmm. whether we'll actually see a difference uh, is another question. Now, Nick began that segment talking about an official neither saying yes nor no exactly. Hans, yeah. I want to ask you about an American official not exactly saying yes or no verbally. That's Joe Manchin. Right. Behind the scenes, he is saying that right now he is a no on the climate change portion of the Biden agenda. Uh, and I think a lot of Democrats think that means he's a no forever. Yeah. But can you take us into exactly what, what's happening there and how big of a deal is this? So he's a no this month is what Manchin would tell you. Um, and so this was this last 24 hours, the big discussion about this, because Manchin went to Schumer and Manchin said, I'm just not going to be there this month on a broader package for climate and energy. And we can just do the numbers real quick. He'd always been talking about 300 billion. That was generally a ballpark. 
this morning. Manchin clarifies his comments, calls into a West Virginia radio show that we all listened to for the first time. Hoppy Kirschval, great show. <laughs> and, and, it was a good I, show. It was a great show. It's yeah. dynamic. It's fun. Uh, he calls in and says, actually, I'm for Medicare doing re renegotiating drugs through Medicare. I'm for something for the health care exchanges. And I'm for taking a lot of money, $240 billion if you back it out, towards deficit reduction. But nothing on climate and energy this month. Mm -hmm. He wants to wait for the inflation numbers, and which, which we all know are going to come. The July numbers will come later on in August when the CPI number hits. And that's always been the barometer for Joe Manchin is inflation, inflation, inflation. He's been talking about this for months. He's felt that his theory of the case has been validated every time the numbers go higher. And he's not in a position to really move with, when inflation is this high. He's certainly not moving any more warmly toward anything. And Trini, I want to ask you, Joe Manchin's effectively had a veto pen on this president. This might sound like a kind of a joke, but I mean it quite sincerely. Like, is Joe Manchin defining the Biden presidency? How much is he defining the Biden presidency? He certainly is. I mean, he's basically, you know, prime minister of Joe Manchin at, at this point. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the president knows that and has tried to work with him, uh, tried to negotiate directly with, with Joe Manchin, and it hasn't really worked out. He was asked, the president was asked today if, if he thinks that Joe Manchin is negotiating in good faith. And the president basically said, I don't know. I haven't done the negotiating on this myself. Um, so he he didn't really answer yes or no on that front. Um, but, you know, the, Joe Manchin has, uh, every senator in the Senate, of course, has so much power. And Joe Manchin is certainly wielding that power over and over again. And this was just the latest. And, you know, the, the fact that the White House pitched this massive proposal, and just mainly because of Joe Manchin, a little bit also because of Kristen Cinema, this package has slimmed down over the months. And right now, it's, it's basically to the bare minimum. And uh, the president said today that the Senate should go ahead and move forward on it, because this seems to be all that they're going to get. Without the climate provisions in it, right. Exactly. So, Nick, I want to bring all this back to you and Jetta and our president. And I'm curious, you've spent a lot of time in the region. You've been traveling around the region right now. How is President Biden seen there? I think it's not just President Biden. I think we have to call a spade a spade. And then a lot of governments in the Middle East see the United States as a receding power. Um, you know, I think that the Trump administration's efforts were to try and stem that tide and were to try and accelerate what was already happening, which is cooperation between Israel and the Sunni governments uh, as a response to the Iranian threat and as a response to what they saw as the Obama administration's apathy to the region. Uh, and as some of the regional actors told me during the Trump administration, as a response to not, suring, not being sure what, was, what Trump was actually up to. Uh, and so we saw the Abraham Accords. We saw all this momentum uh, between Sunni Arab governments and Israel that saw uh, Iran as, uh, as, as a mutual threat. And the Biden administration's jumping on that momentum. Uh, they are simply trying to accelerate things. And Saudi is the crown jewel of that effort of normalization. Israeli officials, Saudi officials, all Arab officials say that if Saudi took any kinds of steps toward normalization. It really would be a game changer militarily, intelligence, and certainly politically. That's just not going to happen, uh, frankly, according to officials uh, across the region, until King Salman dies. Uh, and it's not going to happen until Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Uh, really do have, have a better relationship. But that's clearly where the momentum is going. And so the U.S. is part of that right now. Uh, but frankly, that momentum was started uh, irrespective of U.S. policy. It's fascinating, these tectonic plates around the world of power, sometimes defined by one man, sometimes not by one man. Someone, sometimes one man has to kind of go along with them. Nick Schifrin, I want to thank you for joining us, for sharing your reporting, staying up past your normal waking hours for us. We appreciate it. Thanks very much. On Tuesday, the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack held its seventh public hearing. They charged that President Trump planned in advance to call on his supporters to march on the Capitol, but wanted it to seem impromptu. We heard a salvo of sound bites about an unhinged Oval Office meeting that include discussions of declaring martial law and the federal government seizing voting machines. Since that hearing came news from a government watchdog that the Secret Service deleted text messages from January 5th and 6th of 2021. Joining us now to discuss this is Luke Broadwater, congressional reporter for The New York Times, my colleague there in the halls on the Hill. Luke, thank you so much for joining us with our panel here. Hey, I want to start with you in sort of a question about 
taking us thinking about the narrative arc of this committee over seven hearings so far, what do you think they were trying to connect? What dots were they trying to connect this week? Sure. I think if you look at each of the hearings and sort of as a big picture, if you step back, they suggest almost every time a different avenue of wrongdoing by President Trump. If you look at some of the earlier hearings, they were suggesting the fake elector scheme as a matter for investigation. They were uh, suggesting obstructing an official proceeding of Congress. They were uh, suggesting defrauding the American people and even his own, yeah, even his own donors. And so I think what we're going to see at this next hearing is a lot of talk about dereliction of duty. And, and you know, that, can, that could potentially have legal implications, but it definitely has ethical and political imp implications for the former president. And so each of these hearings is a different avenue that the January 6th committee is suggesting, not only to the public, but also to the Justice Department, that this is an area to investigate. And here are a lot of details and facts that present a pretty damning case against the former president. Tarina, can you help us with that? The Department of Justice, what do we know about where they are and where other investigations are in terms of possible criminal charges for the Trump administration um, and those right around it? Well, we know that uh, Merrick Garland, the attorney general, is under increasing pressure to do something. You know, every, we're, every, with every hearing, we're seeing more and more evidence. Uh, as you said, the committee has been connecting a lot of dots here. And so it's been putting, putting pressure on, on Justice Department officials to do something. Uh, most recently, we also heard from Congresswoman Liz Cheney, who brought up uh, another potential evidence uh, of or instance of witness tampering. And she said that they referred that case to the Department of Justice. So they're starting to share inf more information now between the committee and the Department of Justice. Justice. Um, and so we'll see how uh, how the case, how the, how the Department of Justice is, is able to build a case, whether or not they're able to do that. Uh, but they certainly are under a lot of pressure right now. Han, speaking of someone sharing more information, Pat Cipollone sat for eight hours with yeah. the committee behind closed doors last week, and we saw a video of his testimony this week. How significant of a figure is the former White House counsel in all of this? Oh, I think he's providing an enormous amount of intelligence and insight on what was happening on those days leading up to and then the day of January 6th. And, you know, I mean, there was a question on whether or not he was going to testify, whether or not he was going to invoke executive privilege. You know, and Luke might be in a better position to sort of adjudicate on what's new and what we've learned, but it seems like a lot of the facts that are out there on January 6th, we've kind of known through some great reporting from The Times, from Axios, from The Wall Street Journal, but what they're doing is they're really sort of tying it all together. And I liked how he talked about different avenues on different sort of and, and different sort of lines of attack on the president, if that's the right way to put it. And I think the big question is how much are we learning new things or are they proving things that we already knew? And to me, it seems like more of the latter, but I'd be curious on what everyone else has to say. I am going to ask you, Luke, because I have a feeling you might actually dispute that, despite I know the tremendous amount of work the New York Times has done on this issue. Are we hearing new things? Well, we are. I, I do agree with Hans that probably 80, 90 percent of each hearing has been reported. I mean, January 6th, the press, the American press corps, I think, has done a phenomenal job uh, investigating January 6th. I mean, you have some great books that have been written. You've got sort of all-star teams and all the major outlets that are digging into this nonstop. And yet each hearing, they surprise me with something. Yeah. There'll be some text message I've never seen or uh, some deposition I've never heard before. And so, you know, I, I think we learned for the first time at these hearings about the names of specific Congress members who had allegedly sought pardons. We'd heard that Rudy Giuliani or uh, Mark Meadows had allegedly sought pardons. You know, it, you hear about allegations of witness tampering that we didn't know about. So I do think each hearing does present new evidence. The thing that really stuck out, uh, stuck out to me from the last hearing was the text messages with the rally planners, where they were having these sort of private conversations about we're going to have this second secret rally near the near the Capitol, but it's got to be. It, we can't let people know about it. It's got to appear unexpected, and th I think that was some new evidence we hadn't heard before uh, that, about people trying to keep these plans to bring the crowds to the Capitol quiet. 
I also, Trini. I also think that you know it's one thing to report these things, but a lot of, uh, as we learned in 2016, when you know a lot of uh, reporters are covering uh, now, you know, later President uh, Donald Trump, a lot of the, uh, a lot of people aren't reading uh, what we're reporting. So it's one thing <laughs> to actually put it in print, and then another to see it. Uh, you know, uh, in a committee hearing um, and really, uh, you know, have that message get across to the people. I mean, some of these hearings have gotten pretty decent ratings. So I'd say there's a little bit of a difference uh, yeah, on that I front. Think, I think yeah. it's a great point. Is it, are these breaking through to the public? And I think the people that really have the best sort of antenna on that mm -hmm. are Republicans who are nervous that this is going to affect their attempt to take over the House and Senate. Mm -hmm. And from Republicans privately, you hear that these, these hearings have done a decent job, a fairly good job, exposing what Democrats say was a dereliction of duty, potential you know, insurrection, all the different verbs and nouns that we hear. Republicans are the ones that are saying, I think this committee's breaking through. And I'm sure you've mm -hmm. both been picking this up as well. You mm -hmm. talk to as many Republicans as I do when you're on yeah. the Hill. No, it's true. They, they they went into this thinking they didn't need a strategy. Their yep. strategy was no strategy. We're going to ignore it. But that 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 has backfired. And I think part of it, um, some of you have observed too, is that many of the witnesses have been Republicans. Um, I want to talk about a different Republican, sure. Republican on the committee, Liz Cheney, the vice chairman of the committee, ended the proceedings by teasing what you mentioned earlier, Tarini, sort of a bombshell. Let's play this bite. Tried to call a witness in our investigation. That person declined to answer or respond to President Trump's call. Their lawyer alerted us. And this committee has supplied that information to the Department of Justice. Now, this was a fascinating moment in the hearing room, not just because, of course, this was a potential criminal charge, as you're talking about, Tarini, but it was Liz Cheney bringing it up at the very end, yeah. sort of mentioning it. And I don't think most of the committee members knew she was going to do it. And I want to ask Luke, I have reported on this, but I'm interested in your reporting on Liz Cheney's role, because I understand behind the scenes, she's very assertive. She is really pushing the committee. But what is your reporting on that? Yeah, I, I would say Liz Cheney is the most powerful behind the scenes driving force on the committee. Uh, everybody I talk to says, you know, we've got some very aggressive Democrats on this committee, people who are known as very fierce fighters against Donald Trump. That's sort of the reputation. And all of them say Liz Cheney is tougher and more aggressive than we are behind the scenes. And Liz Cheney also, um, because of her uh, role with the so-called gold team, which is the team investigating Donald Trump, uh, she's been sort of overseeing that team. And so she has access to some of these depositions and interviews that other members and staff don't necessarily have. And sometimes I hear from staffers who are completely surprised by something Liz Cheney will bring out at the last minute. But that's part of the, um, I think, the success and the drama of these hearings is they they do have teasers and they have cliffhangers and so it, they they've embraced the sort of um, uh, part elements of television that are not normally present in a Capitol Hill, Hill hearing and that's why I think that they're getting something like you know an average of 14 million viewers for these hearings which I think is unheard of for your normal congressional hearing. Certainly the impeachment hearings did not have this kind of drama, though the stakes were really just as high. Um, I want to ask all of you just in our parting minutes here, you know, I've said, you've probably said on panels before, no one thinks that these will really impact the midterms, these hearings necessarily. We'll see. But I want to ask each of you, could this affect something bigger in terms of how Americans see what happened, how Americans decide they should act? themselves mm -hmm. and their neighbors, Hans. So it's an interesting sort of public policy, public perception question. Mm -hmm. I suspect the most lasting impact of these hearings are whether or not they're going to result in criminal referrals and whether or not the Department of Justice will decide to indict the former president and prevent him from running in 2024. And that is no small decision for any attorney general to make. So to me, that's the big question. So are there criminal referrals and does the Justice Department act on them? And I don't have the answer to that. Luke? The criminal referral discussion, the committee's postponed until they release their report in September. Uh, it does seem like most people I talk to on the committee think that referrals are a good idea. There are some holdouts and skeptics that uh, they don't want to look like they're unduly influencing the Justice Department and any charges against Trump and his allies should seem like they're unaffected by politics. But the committee at this point has done so much publicly calling for for a Justice Department investigation, I don't know how you sort of put that genie back in the box. I mean, 
you know, they, they've said Merrick Garland, do your job. And Adam Schiff was just on TV criticizing the slowness of the Justice Department's investigation. So they've been pretty open about what they want the Justice Department to do. Tarina, I want to ask you in our last minute. We're, we love tangible things like criminal charges, but I want to ask me a big picture question, too. Yeah. Can, can this move anyone's psyche or culture here? Yeah, I think, you know, we always think of things politically and, you know, in the midterms, it, it's because the economy is on everyone's minds, you know, it's not going to move things. But I think looking ahead to 2024 and how people sort of think about government and the presidency, it might again raise questions about sort of the chaotic time that we went through uh, during the Trump presidency and sort of remind people of that and whether they want to see that again, you know, given that he might be announcing sometime in the fall. I don't know if, you know, philosophically or culturally it'll change much, but maybe, you know, politically looking ahead to 2024, it could have a little bit of impact. I think it could affect the idea that the election was stolen, but we'll see. Anyway, thank you all. We could talk about this so long. We appreciate it. Tarini, Hans, Luke, thank you all so much for joining us. A really good discussion tonight. And before we go, don't you at home forget to watch PBS News Weekend for the latest from on the ground in Saudi Arabia as President Biden wraps up his trip to the Middle East. That's Saturday on PBS News Weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.